This is the fifth and the final week of this message series, Pure Unspoiled Religion. It's a series based on the theme that arises from the letter of James, which has been our second reading during these last five weeks. In the first week of the series, James told us that pure unspoiled religion is this, coming to the help of orphans and widows when they need it and keeping oneself uncontaminated by the world. At the same time, we've also been reminded for, through the book of Isaiah that the Messiah would bring hope and life to those who are afflicted because of his presence amongst us and his witnessing to the love of God. Isaiah told us, your God is coming. He is coming to save you. And then we heard the sign that would be visible so that we would know that God is amongst us. The eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unsealed. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongues of the dumb sing for joy. But we don't see that in our world. In our world today, people have an expectation that every one of their requirements, their needs, is going to be satisfied and almost always immediately. In a world where science claims to be able to answer the questions about life, but we belief in a God who saves us, a God who through his presence amongst us is almost a nonsensical idea and without any proof. And even the thought that people might be prepared to give up worldly ambitions to follow that belief is beyond the comprehension of so many people. So that raises a question. Where do we stand in the midst of this world in which we live? How do we answer the question that Jesus asked his disciples a few weeks ago? Who do you say I am? Now, I suspect most of us could easily, without even thinking, say you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Much the same as Peter said. But what would that look like? What would it seem be seen by others by the witness of our daily living? Would people be able to see that that's who we are? sons and daughters of God, because of the way in which we live our lives and by the things we support and the ways we renounce and the times and way that we renounce the things of the world. Partially, it's also going to mean that we have to do what James challenged us to do, and not fall into the trap of the world. James told us we should accept and submit to the word which has been planted in you and which can save your soul. But then he says, and this is where perhaps the real challenge for us today is, but you must do what the world word tells you and not just listen to it and deceive yourselves. So it's more than just knowing about Jesus. It's actually recognising Jesus as my friend, to be in a relationship with God in such a way that my life is changed. It also means that we perhaps have to have a little bit of an open heart and recognise that we don't have the answer to every question that someone is going to ask us. There might be others in our community who have a much better understanding of what God's particular message is for us at this moment, who use their gifts and their talents to build up the kingdom of God. We hear that in our first reading today where Moses has been struggling because so many people have been making demands on him and he no longer feels able to respond to their challenges. And so he prays and asks the Lord to be with him. So this is what God did. He took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on 70 elders. But it wasn't just these 70 elders that received the spirit. They were the initial group, but there were two men who stayed back in the camp, Eldad and Medad, and the Spirit came down upon them, though they weren't part of the those who had gone to the tent. But their names were enrolled with the rest, and they prophesied in the camp. It reminds us that sometimes there's going to be the most unlikely people in our community who in fact are able to say the most powerful things about the love of God and his witness in their lives. And they can make an incredible difference in the whole community because of their response. The 
too often we fall into the challenge that happens around us. We fall into that trap which seems to think that leaders of the community and not just the people but the leaders of the community are the clergy. Sadly, for many years that's been the case. It's not and we know that each of us by our baptism is called to be a missionary disciple. Father James Mallon, who wrote the book Divine Renovation, but who was talking about how to grow a community where the priest wasn't the leader, but was rather part of a community that led. So he speaks about leading from a team. And that means that we recognise and value the gifts of others. So when Joshua came to complain about Eldad and Medad, Moses looks at him and says, if only the whole people of the Lord were prophets. And the Lord gave his spirit to them all. So we know that God wants us to be witnesses. And that prayer of Moses is in fact a prayer that might be a good prayer for us today. That the Lord would pour out his spirit on all of us and make a difference in the world. But it's not just the Old Testament people who struggled with it. We see in our gospel today there, there is a similar threat to the role of the disciples or the clergy of the day. John comes to Jesus and says, Master, we saw a man who is not one of us casting out devils in your name. And because he was not one of us, we tried to stop him. But Jesus looks at him and said, You must not stop him. For no one who works a miracle in my name is likely to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. Now, it's not quite the same, but it bore a resemblance as I was writing to what happens when a new priest comes to a parish. There's always a change in the relationship between those who were doing ministries and the new pastor. Doesn't matter who he is, doesn't matter what's going on. Everyone has a different relationship. Some people, however, sadly feel that they have now been rejected because they don't have the same relationship and that they're no longer needed or wanted. I don't know how you change that. That's a human condition. But when Jesus and Moses point out today, there are times when different people are called to take move into ministry and leadership in response to the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with where they fit or belong in the community and so each person becomes then the vehicle, the visible gift of the spirit of God's love to the whole community, irrespective of who the priest is or irrespective of who they are. And that's what makes a difference. Jesus said to us last week in the gospel, if anyone wants to be first, he must be, make himself last and servant of all. Reminded to us that no one should come and feel that they're the ones with the most importance. And even goes further today by telling us that if you give a cup of water to one of these because you belong to Christ, then I tell you solemnly, you will not lose your reward. So it's not who we are that is important. It's how we respond to others and how we accept the challenge of living a life that reflects what pure, unspoiled religion is all about. The life that gives hope to all people. But in the midst of hoping for that kind of lifestyle, Jesus also tells us that there are some obstacles to it. Obstacles that speak about the challenges that happen in our community. He uses rather incredible um, witnessing of saying if you lose a hand or an eye, these things, much better to lose them than to be led into sin. It reminds us of what James said last week. It says that there is a challenge to us about how we respond to the gospel message. James told us that all of the things that cause division come from within us. And so using the images of the hand, the eye and the foot, Jesus is saying that it's from within us that evil arises. But if we look at our world today, you have to wonder what other obstacles there are to stop people being open to faith. 
just the other afternoon I was talking to a young uh, teacher who said that it was a real struggle to be able to accept all of the things that happen in the world today and to see how God works in those places. Some of those issues are really challenging, but I suspect there's also the, the challenge for us today in the midst of our world by the language we use as we discuss things and as we share our own thoughts. I heard a woman recently who spoke about some of the reason for conflict in our world and she said this is perhaps part of the answer. She says, she, she made the statement, do you speak the truth in love or do you love to speak the truth? Think about that for a second. Do you speak the truth in love or do you love to speak the truth? And it's usually my truth that I'm speaking when I'm talking to somebody. Now we know that Jesus always speaks the truth and his teaching is a challenge that to us to turn away from the evils of the world to be recreated with a new heart, the heart that we call a heart of metanoia. And today's teaching about the obstacles that others do provide to becoming his disciples and how they're called, allowed to fulfill their lifelong goals, it's important that we look at the world around us. We know as we read the news each day and especially as we reflect on what might happen in the US in the forthcoming elections, that there is a real challenge about what is truth. Pope Francis, in response to questions on his flight back from Singapore and uh, the South Pacific, made this comment, they are both against life, the one who throws away the migrants as well as the one who kills children. Both are against life. Now, the issues in Australia may not be quite as life-threatening, but there's a continuing and a growing concern about the threat to thousands of people who are now struggling with uh, cost-of-living issues that destroy families and communities. We know that there are other issues around the world today where people and cultures have been almost incapacitated by the obstacles that are raised against them. But the question becomes for us, who's prepared to take the responsibility and to work to impact change in our world? Again, James told us at the beginning of the series, pure unsport religion is to come to the aid of widows and orphans when they need it. Surely now is the time, but again I ask, who's prepared to take the responsibility to change the action of world leaders and to give people a chance to live in our world and to be free. The reality is that nothing will happen unless I, and that's not this little fellow standing up in front of you, it's the universal I. Nothing will change unless I am prepared to take away the obstacles and to make a straight path for the Lord. Firstly, though, I need to allow the Lord to enter into my life, to create a new heart in me, so that world leaders, that so that our world becomes a better place. Because if I change, then in fact the world is a better place. And then I have to decide to renew that commitment each day, so that I make a difference in not only my own life, but in the life of my community. It might seem just a little step in the face of the challenges which confront our world. But it is a step. And in order to achieve any goal, especially such an important goal, I have to take this first step. And by my witnesses witnessing, I have to invite you to take the step with me, to speak out in the name of the Lord and to encourage others to do the same. I said at the beginning of Mass today is Migrant and Refugee Sunday. This theme for 2024 is God walks with his people. The 
which means that if I take a little step, then God, in fact, is walking with me.